Hello, my name is Leslie, and I would like to give you an introduction to our project to make Antarctica and its heritage accessible to new audiences through storytelling and immersive technologies. The project is called Immersive Antarctica and is funded by Innovate UK. I'm giving this presentation on behalf of both the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust and Anglia Ruskin University Story Lab. I would like to start by telling you a little bit about who UK Antarctic Heritage Trust are and why we've embarked on this particular project. UKHT is a charity and it is the guardian of six former British species now all registered as Antarctic sites and monuments on the Antarctic Peninsula. We maintain and conserve and protect them seasonally in Antarctica, whilst working year round from our UK base to manage and promote the sites and their unique stories which are held by both ourselves and within the British Antarctic Survey Archive Department. Currently, only one site is staffed for several months each year. This is Port Lockroy, which has a small museum, the world's most southerly post office, a small shop and a colony of Gentoo penguins who decided to become our neighbours in the 80s. During the Antarctic summer, up to 18,000 people can land at Port Lockroy and visit, however, even for these people who have the good fortune and privilege to walk around our flagship site and museum, the opportunity to explore the site, its artefacts and its tales is extremely restricted due to the highly constrained landing schedule, which limits the time of their visit. These hurried visits and relatively high numbers makes it impossible for people to fully grasp the depth of the tangible and intangible history that they're standing at the physical threshold of. Port Lockthoy was Britain's first Antarctic base in 1944, a wartime political statement that established the beginnings of the British Antarctic Territory and the first location of a series of early scientific undertakings, instrumental in informing our current understanding of the climate and climate change. Moreover, over the course of 40 years, hundreds of men lived and worked on these sites. They spent months journeying to Antarctica by ship, in the early days, many weren't told which site they were destined for until they were almost there, and once on the peninsula, they faced weeks each year of sharing close quarters with potentially a dozen others in a hut that was sent to Antarctica flat-packed and constructed by numbers by scientists and field assistants. They would keep busy with chores such as painting walls and fixing equipment, or binge reading whatever material was to hand, whether that was an epic Tolkien trilogy or the latest edition of Women's Weekly to have arrived courtesy of the dog food packing factory workers back in the UK who, knowing the remote location the delivery was headed for, would add in magazines as a surprise for these Antarctic inhabitants. Then there was the field work. Weeks and months out on the Uncharted Peninsula surveying or gathering data, facing down whatever elements and dangers Antarctica threw at them. This interim period of Antarctic history, which we care for, is often overlooked for the heroic era or for modern science species. And this is something we're seeking to remedy with this project. Each of the sites we care for has a unique identity, its own character and its own distinct stories and role in helping us to understand our climate, our planet, and thanks to the human stories we have archived, the ability to share, even ourselves. For our current project, we're investiga investigating the stories of Base E, our most southerly site on Stonington Island. Base E is fascinating for a host of reasons. It was a key location for dog sledding thanks to direct access to the peninsula. It had an airplane landing strip for the period of time, and it shares the same island as a former American base known as East Base, which had an expedition party that included the first women who wintered in Antarctica. In order to make our UKHT projects and our histories accessible in a meaningful way, we are keen to collaborate with others to produce projects which will have the most impact. As such, for this specific BASE project, we have the support of Education Scotland, with whom we are working closely to select the best stories from the site in order to make our BASE E immersive Antarctica experience suitable and exciting for young people, both in Scotland and further afield, and to make it fit well within the Scottish curriculum so that it can become a useful and valuable resource for teaching young people about and inspiring young people about Antarctic history, its environment and its importance for our collective future. This is a very practical and creative project, and it got underway a few years ago now in our Antarctic 1819 season, 
With support from colleagues from within the British Antarctic Survey, a data collection programme began. Some of our sites have been captured through either laser scanning or photogrammetry, and in some instances both. And this data set is providing the basis both for our immersive Antarctica projects and helping to aid our colleagues in conservation planning. From this data, we are able to construct or reconstruct with the help of historic documents, a digital vision of our sites into which we can embed the stories of the past. These can be in the form of images, video footage, oral testimonies, or by extracting information from the many reports completed on site. And we are exploring the different ways to embed this history into the new virtual space. From gamified and embodied experiences which allow the player to live aspects of life on base as it would have been then through reconstruction and interactions, to using the method of augmented virtuality, surrounding the player in the digital world with pieces of real world archive, effectively overlaying the historic lived past onto the player's lived digital present. It's an exciting part of the research and development process. And I'll play you a short video now which shows some of the media we have. The footage is provided by our colleagues in the Bass archives and much of the audio was recorded in Antarctica around 1965 by Dave Matthews. And the vo voice you'll hear is Neil Marsden who also worked at Stonington in 65. The video also shows the structure of the base E main hut and the processes being undertaken to make it suitable for use from photogrammetry to 3D model. I didn't have a dog team the first year. We didn't have enough dogs for everybody to have a dog team, and I was the one who uh, who missed out. But for this particular trip, I'd actually borrowed a dog team off the base leader, as it happened. And we were going up to northeast Glacier to look at uh, to set up survey stations, find previous survey stations, set up new ones for a local triangulation scheme. <laughs> The format we've chosen for this project is virtual reality. Whilst we realise there are limitations to the use of VR as an accessible technology, as it's not nearly as ubiquitous as smartphones, it is on the increase, and there are numerous programmes supporting the use of VR in high schools as an educational tool which we're excited about, as we look forward to involving students directly with the project. The involvement of students and people from all walks of life is important to us because the exciting part of a project such as this isn't only letting people experience a location that 99.99% of the po world's population will never see, although that is a fairly amazing goal to be aiming for in terms of making our Antarctic bases accessible, but the even more exciting part is making it really chime with the player. The hope that with our current project is to embed specific parts of the histories that not only meet learning outcomes to make the project viable as an educational resource by touching on key points such as the physical evidence of climate change on site and Antarctic history and material culture, 
but also to highlight the characters and the pieces of history that specific audiences can relate to. For the young Scots whom we hope will access and enjoy this project, that means having the opportunity to highlight the Scottish characters who worked at the end of the world. Both of the first British expedition leaders were born in Scotland, Scottish James Marr and Canadian Andrew Taylor. Identifying ships like the John Biscoe and the Bransfield built in Scottish ports, and the Scottish involvement that demonstrates the diversity of skills and resources and persons from all walks of life that was needed to make living and working in Antarctica possible. We are immersive Antarctica. We don't just want to make Antarctica accessible, we want to make it relatable. And we want people from all over the world to feel a connection with this rich and varied period of the past through the archival data and stories we hold. And we believe that digital and immersive technologies are the best way we can achieve this. And whilst our current project has a distinctly Scottish focus on account of the particular audience, partners and goals we're working with and towards, life and activity in Antarctica was and is truly international, as Stonington demonstrates as an islander base of two nations. As such, this is the first of what we hope will be a series of projects exploring the best ways to make Antarctica accessible and to share its unique stories. And we'd be happy to speak more with anyone who'd like to potentially join us on this journey or who would just like to hear a bit more about it. On behalf of the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust and ARU Story Lab, thank you very much for your time.